Um, reaction engineering and catalytic technology, that's the group. We work on uh, new types of reactor systems and catalysts to find new uh, practical ways of produ producing efficient chemicals and energy conversion technologies. Um, out of that, this is what we do. I've highlighted the two, and I've, I've sort of picked out two future scanning ideas, technologies that I want to talk to you about. One is in solar biofuels, and the other one is in clean fossil fuels. So um, we've been working quite a lot on a long time with, with algae systems, and you have probably heard about algae systems for different types of energy applications. We've done work on biohydrogen, so you can uh, force algae to produce hydrogen for you. We have worked on biomass conversion. These would be the usual biomethane through fermentation, bioethanol. You can, you can paralyze oils, you can make biochar, and you can directly make oils. I'm not going to talk about that. Also not going to talk about the, the latest work in biofuels, which we're doing with Volkswagen and Volvo. This is for making direct drop-in fuels also using algae, but I'm going to focus now on uh, something a bit different, and that's bioelectricity. So um, up to 90% of the world's electronic waste, and that's also mobile phones and all that sort of stuff, is illegally dumped in the world. Yeah? So there's, there's actually a big problem in making all these nice so distributed energy systems, batteries and, and what not, but you need to think about the end of life here. Um, um, also, if you look at this, you know, we're, we have all sorts of, you know, million, uh, thousands of tons of batteries and so forth in, in the European <laughs> Union. Can't go into landfill anymore. You need to do something about these things. So we thought, why don't we go the next step and make ultra cheap batteries? Ultra cheap batteries which are completely biodegradable. And if you look at what, what has been sort of established in, in, in the literature, there are different types of, of uh, bio batteries that people have looked at. So you can see here microbial fuel cells, photosynthetic microbial fuel cells, complex systems which interact with each other. And here, probably one of the simplest systems, a bio photovoltaic system. So we use directly the light, you convert that with a photosynthetic uh, organism into electrons, and, and some of those electrons you just harvest to uh, power something else. Um, some analysis has been done on these systems, and the, the, the types of, of powers that you could get per square meter is, is just so shown here. These are sort of estimates based on, on the type of conversion efficiencies that you can achieve with, with photosynthetic organisms. So you've all probably played around with this, okay? So a typical sort of uh, uh, bio battery, if you want. Um, there hasn't been a lot in, in that area, maybe something like 37 studies uh, from 1964 to 2008, and we've now really sort of pushed this a little bit forward by taking algae and simply printing those directly uh, to, to produce paper-based batteries. Um, I should say, when we did that, we published that in Nature, and it was really immediately picked up by, by Forbes and, and, and the World Economic Forum and, and so forth. It was quite amazing, uh, the, the, the publicity that, that we got from that. So how does that work? Well, um, you simply uh, print the, on, onto paper a, a carbon anode, and car um, then you print your algae directly onto that system, and then you print your... your uh, uh, cathode onto it as well. And the nice thing is you can envisage this to be done roll to roll and the nice thing is these are essentially dry systems. You know? So if you choose the right algae then they don't need to be particularly in a wet environment to do the job. You know? And what, what um, the algae will do if you eliminate them they, they will provide more power but as you eliminate them they, they will produce hydrocarbons which they store in their cell and if, if, then you, if you then take the, the, the light away they will still give you a base load of, of electrons flowing yeah? because what they do is they convert the hydrocarbons that they've just produced 
between the light cycle and, and the dark cycle. So you will always have a base load here, uh, which, which you can sort of uh, remove. What we've done is we were able to uh, parallelize our little cells here, and we could then actually run a digital clock on some LEDs of that. Yeah, so you can get a reasonable power out of that. So we were able to inkjet print these, these thin film uh, biological systems directly onto paper, completely biodegradable system. Um, the powers that we're, we're generating are still fairly low, but you know, give us some time here because, as I said, this is a bit of future scanning activity. This is not something that you can roll out probably in, in the next couple of years. Um, certainly, big interest already from ARM technologies on that uh, because they're interested to power then their next generation of low, low power uh, 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 integrated circuits with, with these types of uh, cells. There are alternatives, of course, just in terms of well-being. What you can do is once you can print algae systems, you can also use them for other applications, such as green wallpapers. The nice thing about that would be it would you know, modify, certainly, the environment that we're sitting in here at the moment, where I don't want to know what the CO2 level is here. Um, it would certainly so sort of increase the oxygen level, and it would also change, change the humidity in, in, in the room. Alternatively, you can look at food supplements where we could so, uh, print, print uh, food supplements with, with high vitamin A, vitamin B and so forth um, uh, content. Because you should know if you eat fish, you know all the vitamins and whatever that you're taking out of the fish, they're actually from the algae that the fish eat. You know, the fish don't produce any of that. Okay, now completely different area, methane. So that's, that's from, from the clean fossil fuels aspect. Um, what you can see here is how the uh, proven sort of energy, uh, methane uh, uh, resources have sort of increased over the years. Uh, that's been going hand in hand with <coughs> consumption pretty much. So when people talk about peak oil, peak gas, it doesn't actually exist. Okay? We're awash with methane. Yeah? So these are just estimates by PBP. We've, we've got a, so reverse reserves over production of, of more than 50 years. Then people talk about potential reserves. So that depends on how technologies improve. We, we, can, we can increase that to even further. And then we've got unconventional resources, hydrates, which get you to very, very long times indeed. Now, at the moment, what, what people do and what many people do is we're using that methane, we're going down those stairs and we're making synthesis gas. Yeah. Or we combust it. Those are the two options at the moment. Um, that produces a lot of CO2, as you can see here. I'm not going to go into the details of the exergy analysis here now. But what we are proposing to do is we're proposing to carbonize the methane. So we're taking the methane, we're producing carbon and hydrogen. Okay. And if you do the exergy analysis, you'll find that's actually quite an interesting proposition here. And once you do that, then the, the issue of storing carbon becomes one of storing carbon, maybe just putting it back where we took out the coal in the first place. So the hygiene, of course, um, in terms of reducing equivalence, very desirable, particularly for the chemicals industry, because that's one way of decarbonizing the chemicals industry. What's the big problem here? It's actually the carbon deposition. Lots of attempts have been made at, at solving this, but what you really need is a different reactor and catalyst technology to do the job. And indeed, we've, we've done so. There have been some other works on molten metals systems, and we've done that on, on molten salt reactors, if I can just show you. These are, these are very high temperature sort of systems, so, so it's very difficult to actually run these things in a laboratory environment. But we can show you that these things work. In a second, the student will take out the, the reactor. The reactor is at around 1,000 degrees here. Okay? It's a bubble column reactor. We're just bubbling the methane in, and we're getting carbon and hydrogen coming out of that. 
The change in color is just simply because the emissivity changes with, with temperature. And what we can see here is the uncatalyzed system as a function of temperature. And if you then have a, a fluidized bed with a catalyst, then we can increase the conversion significantly. And you can run that for quite a long time here before eventually the, the catalyst sort of gives up on you. And we've got an idea why that is, and we can probably prolong that quite significantly longer here. The interesting thing then becomes in what, what type of calm are we actually producing here? Maybe instead of just putting the carbon away again, we can actually use that carbon as carbon filaments and so forth, right? So there, there's actually going to be a value uh, associated with that carbon. So we've shown this as uh, the molten salt reactor to possibly be an intermittent solution to, to, to the, the hydrogen <coughs> problem that we're facing. It's hydrogen that's CO2 free and can be produced CO2 free. We've got a facile carbon separation rather than the issue around CO2 uh, capture. Um, that's something that we still need to work on. So, and just, just to make it a case here, this is Canada, right? And what you see here is all these lakes. And these lakes are forming <coughs> because the hydrates, so that's methane, that's stored in the permafrost. And because of global warming, that's being released now slowly. And so that forms all these lakes. And if you know that, the, the global warming potential of, of methane is far higher than that of CO2, we ought to do something about the methane, at least burn it. OK, so take home message. Printed paper-based biophotonic batteries have the potential to provide low-cost energy for distributed low power sensor systems, and maybe the Internet of Things. And methane pyrolysis offers the energetically favorable CO2-free production of hydrogen fuel for transportation, but probably more for the chemicals industry to co completely decarbonize the chemicals industry. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much.